Hello and welcome to The Point World Affairs. I'm your host, Daniel Che. On our program, we delve a little deeper into some of the stories turning heads and making headlines outside of Korea. To help dissect them into digestible bites, we are joined again by Professor Song Se-ryeon of Kyung University. Thank you so much for being here with us. I'm happy to be here with you, Daniel. All right, Professor, you know the drills. We have a bunch of interesting words out there linked to uh, some fascinating stories or important stories from around the world. I'll let you go first. Choose a word. Okay. All right, in the spirit of first thing first, I'll pick first. The people of Slovakia elected its sole female presidential candidate, Jasana Kapitova, as their new commander-in-chief. The 45-year-old liberal lawyer is not only the country's first female president, but she's also the youngest leader to be elected in the country. Prijímam toto rozhodnutie s veľkou pokorou a s uvedomovaním si veľkej zodpovednosti. Ďakujem vám všetkým, že ste boli so mnou a slúbujem vám, že ja budem s vami. Ďakujem za všetko, za všetku podporu v kampani. Budem s tými, ktorí mi dali hlas, ale budem aj s vami, ktorých dôveru som si zatiaľ nezískala a budem sa o ňu uchádzať ďalej pri výkone svojho mandátu. Kapitova gained just over 58% of the vote in a second-round runoff against heavyweight politician Maros Sefcovic, the vice president of the European Commission for the Energy Union. Potrebujeme vrátiť dôveru ľudí v štát. Potrebujeme vrátiť dôveru ľudí v spravodlivosť. A ja som nesmierne šťastný, že dnes večer si Slovensko zvolilo presne takú prezidentu. While Kapitova is a political newbie, her election as president appears to reflect the public sentiment of corruption-weary voters. Well, other than being the first female president of Slovakia, she is of course a lawyer who is a, a candidly dubbed the Erin Brockovich of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, it, she has looked to try and change things in Slovakia, especially in terms of fighting corruption. Right. Slovakia, I think, is a very interesting story. Uh, about a year ago, Slovakian people were outraged because of the murder of a journalist who was investigating into a graft or corruption of government officials. And uh, because of the outrage, people took to the street and there was a big demonstrations and uh, this uh, a very liberal lawyer uh, was a kind of a forefront of that campaign against the graft. And I hear that's when she decided to run for public office. Now, she's a, a complete neophyte in the political sector, and this is the first time she's was won uh, political office. But as, as you said, uh, uh, the surrounding countries are all turning rightward and conservative. So the Slovakia being a very led by a very liberal president, I think is a very interesting story. Of course, our concern is that uh, the presidency in the country is mainly a ceremonial position, though. Right, uh, but she does have a veto power, and she does have a power to uh, pick the top judges. So she does have some symbolic as well as some substantial powers. So I, I, I think it's going to be kind of emblematic and also symbolic in the region where uh, right word direction has been pretty uh, pronounced through these days. Right, welcome change from uh, this particular part of our world. Let's choose our next word. I'm going to uh, take my turn this time, Professor. Right. I choose the word jets. Mm -hmm. On March 31st, two J-11 fighter jets from the Chinese Air Force crossed a maritime border separating China and Taiwan, triggering a 10-minute standoff between the two sides. Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen strongly condemned China in a remark made at a military award ceremony. <laughs>
Beijing's actions are seen as a protest against the U.S. and Taiwan's arms deal, with Washington set to sell 60 F-16s and warships to the Taiwan Strait. This latest round of cross-strait tension is set to further strain U.S.-China relations. Well, this won't be the first time China is conducting a provocative act to impose its notion that um, the territory belongs to China. Right. This drama of David versus Goliath continue. <laughs> and it's a very interesting but also scary story because uh, as China throws its weight more, uh, a lot of people are getting nervous. Uh, not only Taiwan, but uh, Japan also uh, had a little bit of a scare because of this incursion into uh, territory in that region. So I, I think that this has a larger background of China versus U.S. U.S. is uh, sending more uh, ships in the, the open waters there. So uh, we will have to see what kind of dynamics develop uh, because of the regional uh, tensions uh, caused by these two uh, Chinas. But in the background, there is China and also the uh, United States. Because of the developments from in Hong Kong after the transition, uh, some uh, countries are more supportive of Taiwan pre pre preserving its democracy and, uh, of course, its sovereignty. Right. Uh, China has, uh, of course, uh, several pockets of uh, s similar concerns, I mean, uh, Xinjiang, Uyghur uh, region, and also Hong Kong and Taiwan. So uh, their policy of uh, preserving kind of unity in, in different cultures as promised at the time, uh, probably is at a testbed uh, with this kind of events. Uh, but I, I think that Taiwan matter is more serious because Taiwan has uh, preserved uh, so much of its her heritage in, in the island. So going forward, uh, whether China will uh, use uh, military forces or, or very heavy-handed tactics, or are they going to be diplomatic and try to be more conciliatory? There's so many fascinating facets and elements to this uh, unique relationship between the two sides. Uh, we we'll don't have time to cover all of it, so we'll move on to our next topic. I will let you choose another word. All right, for me, next topic, let's go with the message. Good choice. Pope Francis made a two-day visit to Morocco, where he delivered messages on religious terrorism, conflicts, and refugee issues. Arriving in Rabat, the Pope first sent a message of warning against religious extremism. È infatti indispensabile opporre al fanatismo e al fondamentalismo la solidarietà di tutti i credenti, avendo come riferimento inestimabile del nostro agire in a joint statement signed with Moroccan King Mohammed VI, the Pope said that Jerusalem should be a quote-unquote symbol of peaceful coexistence after Trump recognized Jerusalem as capital of Israel last year. Noi riteniamo importante preservare la città santa di Jerusalem, al Quotsa Sharif, come patrimonio comune dell'umanità e soprattutto per i fedeli delle tre religioni monoteiste, come luogo di incontro e simbolo di coesistenza pacifica, in cui si coltivano il rispetto reciproco e il dialogo. During his return trip from Morocco, Pope Francis said that those who close borders will become prisoners of the walls that they build. In a country where Christianity or Catholics are very small minorities, uh, the Pope Francis was there to send a message of promoting greater fraternity and a coexistence between religions. Right. Uh, whenever Pope sends this kind of message of peace, uh, this is a good thing for people. Uh, these days, because of the cultural conflict, a seemingly big conflict between the Christianity and Islamic faith, uh, I think that this is a necessary move and a very uh, timely move. And the highlight of the trip was the Pope and the Moroccan King signing a joint appeal for Jerusalem's freedom and uh, safety and right to worship for uh, every different kind of uh, religious uh, faith people have. Right. As you know, Jerusalem is a holy uh, city for uh, major religions, uh, Judaism, Christianity, both of them, Catholic and Protestant, and also Islamic faith. So acknowledging that a peaceful coexistence is possible even, 
uh, is a very symbolic and also peaceful message. Uh, I think that this is a, a great message, uh, although it, it's symbolic, but this is uh, something that people need. On this week's The Point World Affairs, we go back to the Mexican border wall dispute. U.S. President Donald Trump threatened to close the border if Mexico does not stop the surge of people crossing over to U.S. territory. Trump, an anti-immigration hardliner, said he will no longer tolerate illegal immigrants and that he will close down the entire border or a substantial part of it unless Mexico cooperates. So Mexico is tough. They can stop them, but they chose not to. Now they're going to stop them. And if they don't stop them, we're closing the border. They'll close it and we'll, we'll keep it closed for a long time. I'm not playing games. Mexico has to stop it. Mexico sends buses. They send trucks. They do absolutely. They started at one point a little bit stopping. They don't do anything to stop it right now. Mexican President Lopez Obrador, who has been refraining from responding, finally spoke out against Trump's border tantrum. Ya, ya el mexicano no está buscando trabajo en Estados Unidos. La mayoría son eh, pobladores de nuestras repúblicas hermanas de Centroamérica. Tensions between the U.S. and Mexico is set to persist for the time being. Well, there you have it. That's our main talking point for today. It's over in the United States where President Donald Trump made another drastic decision to uh, warning about a possibility of shutting down borders, Professor. But of mm -hmm. course, uh, looking at it from America's perspective, Trump also mentioned that it is all about security regardless of the economic losses or other uh, uh, damages that they could suffer because of this decision. Right. On one hand, this is uh, Trump being Trump. He has been very consistent about the border policy and his uh, presidential bid was uh, uh, greatly buoyed by the chant of build a war. Uh, I, I think he recognized that this is what his base wants, uh, what the conservative has been kind of clamoring for over the years. Uh, however, uh, to be fair with, with Trump, I, I guess there is a kind of a surge of the southern border uh, immigrant population or or rush to it. Uh, but at the same time, is this a right way to address the issue by just building a wall? Or because the, the problem is about what's happening in the, the triangle uh, countries uh, in, in South America and <clears throat> Central America, and also the, the Mexico's policy. So uh, I, I think that by just uh, simply building the wall, Actually, we contrast with the Pope's policy of kind of tearing down the wall between the people and, and, and choosing to go with a harmony. Uh, I, I don't think that a lot of people, uh, other than his base, is uh, in, in sync with his thinking of just uh, using the physical barrier uh, as a, a measure to address the issue. It tends to put the squeeze and see what happens. That seems to be the approach by President Trump, uh, continuing his ways. And now mm -hmm. let's turn to a, a, a different take from outside of Korea. We have an expert standing by from the United States, Guadalupe Correa Cabrera, Associate Professor at George Mason University, on the line for us. Professor, thank you for joining us. Hello. Professor, what is the local sentiment regarding Trump's ultimatum? How is it being received among the Mexican community? President Donald Trump has decided to declare a national emergency and he might uh, shut down the border. That, that would be a major thing because that would affect the two countries greatly in economic terms. We don't know. There is an indefinition. There are people that are alleged that there is a humanitarian crisis at the border. Certainly, we have dozens of dozens of people every day uh, applying for asylum some of them families, unaccompanied minors, lots of people. And according to the president or the current administration in the United States, there is no capacity to process all the people because of the very big fluxes that are right now arriving to the border. And therefore, the president Donald Trump is declaring an emergency, but 
this has to do with his prom the promise of his campaign uh, before the election of 2016 that he would build the border wall, a big beautiful wall. He insists on build this wall and this is why we had the biggest shutdown, government shutdown in the history of the United States this year and later the president declared a national emergency when the Congress, when the Democratic Party didn't agree to fund or to provide the, the, the funds for the construction of this wall. We really don't know what's going to happen. There is a lot of uncertainty. Uh, it doesn't, it is not clear that this is a real crisis or it's a manufactured crisis. Definitely there are many families in children, well, children, women, unaccompanied minors that are trying to make it to the United States. That's definitely not uh, national security uh, threat or an emergency that that justifies the utilization of the military or or a government shutdown. I think uh, it's it's complex for both countries, also for the United States. Um, the United States economy is at stake because it will be, you know, and many many um, businesses that operate at the border will be will be uh, affected by by this government, by when this border shut down. And if you shut down the border, there are so many, you know, so many negative implications uh, also for Mexico. And there's another thing that the United States has been taking unilaterally decisions to, for example, instead of processing asylum requests uh, of asylum seekers um, in the United States, the main, the bottom line is that he wants more money to build a wall, to increase the military border industrial complex, technology, the utilization of drones, more boots on the ground, to protect the, 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 the border, allegedly to protect the border. But basically, this is really a lot of money for contractors that might be connected to, to some interest in the United States. All right, thank you so much, Professor, for your time, your insights. We appreciate it. Now, Professor Song, uh, it looks like uh, there's, uh, there are two sides to this story, a right. way of looking at it. And of course, uh, it seems like Trump tends to do a 180 on a lot of things quite drastically and suddenly. And he perhaps is expecting Mexico to do something about the influx of uh, illegal immigrants themselves. Right. Uh, Mexico might have a little bit of a different stance with uh, other uh, countries in the region because uh, Obrador, President Obrador had this uh, campaign pledge of kind of an open door policy. He wanted to be a gentler and more kind uh, nation and their leadership. And because of that, uh, Mexico had a, a influx of immigrants f from on its own southern border. But those people coming into Mexico are straight going into the United States, a lot of them. So uh, that uh, he also shares a little bit of responsibility for the, the, the mini surge that, that the United States is experiencing in this southern border. But uh, as the professor pointed out, the economic impact of a shutting down is so great. I mean, the measure is such a draconian measure. Uh, last year, the estimated about six hundred uh, billion dollars were exchanged in the, in, during the border, and even without the to talk about the figure, the, the supply network in the Northern uh, Hemisphere and the Northern America is centered around the relationship between the, the U.S. and the Mexico and the surrounding countries. So shutting down the border seems to be one of the kind of a more draconian measures that he have used and the rhetoric that he has used. Right, now it's, uh, it's uh, two choices two sides of the coin for President Donald Trump, uh, sticking with his guns, uh, governing the way he campaigned, or considering all the side effects of shutting the border. Thank you so much for uh, your insights on this matter. And now it's time for us to move on to a different segment of our program. This installment mm -hmm. of our program is where we take a quick trip around the globe for the snippets that grabbed attention in various corners of our world. First, let's head over to Indonesia. Would you believe that this little orangutan was found drugged at an airport in Bali? A sleeping baby orangutan was rescued from a tourist baggage en route to Russia. In other bags, several more lizards were found. The suspect identified as a 27-year-old Russian man said that he attempted to smuggle the primate to bring it home as a pet. 
It's a relief that the incident concluded as a failed attempt. Next, we head over to the U.S. again. Can you guess who lived in Los Angeles 50,000 years ago? More than 600 Ice Age fossils have been found at a subway construction site in Los Angeles. The fossils were of a variety of ancient creatures, including extinct mammoths, swordfish, and sloths. Well, we're incredibly lucky that in California there is such strict mitigation, so that there is requirement for there to be a paleontologist anytime you're digging in native soils. That way, any fossil or artifact that peeks out of that dirt is seen immediately and can be saved. These laws don't exist everywhere, and so fossils are probably being lost all the time. Experts say the newly discovered fossils will be an important key to unlocking Earth's secrets thousands of years ago. Next, we head over to Turkey. A village in southern Turkey. A large parasol moves in the wind next to the huddled crowd. Three men try to catch the parasol, but it doesn't work. Ooh, wow. At this moment, the parasol flies away with a man being lifted into the air. Fortunately, the man said he suffered only a slight injury to his ankle and was not seriously harmed. This ended as a funny episode that almost took the man to heaven trying to save a parasol. Our next stop is China. A giant elephant was filmed wandering the streets at Yunnan province in China. The massive animal was caught looking somewhat lost as it passed through cars and crossed the streets. Authorities say that the elephant had become separated from its group, but does it look too relaxed to be lost? Luckily, this elephant was returned safely home to its pack. Our last stop is Honduras. Children demonstrating strong kicks with a yellow belt strapped around their waist. This is at an elementary school in Honduras. Honduras became the first country in Latin America to adopt Taekwondo as part of its regular curriculum at a public elementary school in that country. In total, about 1,800 students from 15 schools will take regular Taekwondo classes. Certified local instructors, not Koreans, will teach the children. We hope the students of Honduras will grow healthy both mentally and physically with Taekwondo. Well, who would have thought that a subway station in, in LA was actually a giant museum in some sense? People would say, wait, there's a subway in Los Angeles? I think they would be surprised at that news because of earthquake and all those. But that reminded me, come to think of it, it's not really surprising. Uh, in Los Angeles, there's a place called the La Brea Tar Pit where a natural uh, bitumen or, or asphalt material kind of seeps up. And a lot of bones from the ancient times are preserved because of that. So this adds to the, I guess, the attraction of Los Angeles as uh, not only the Hollywood and all those, but a preserver of some ancient stuff. Yeah, we also have to give credit to those uh, construction workers who actually had curiosity enough to stop Let's get experts to find out what this is about instead of just pouring cement on it and going on with the construction. Oh, yes. And we also had some interesting news from uh, Honduras where Taekwondo has been adopted as the official elementary school curriculum. I do hope they lay some uh, uh, safety <laughs> mats because they're doing it on asphalt and it's kind of dangerous. Right. They, they look so cute. I mean, uh, Taekwondo studios, other cities are nothing new. But included in the official curriculum, I think it's new. I think it's a recognition that Taekwondo sharpens not only your body, but your mind as well. Yeah, it has become a, a more uh, gentler sport over the years instead of the deadly martial art that it originally once was. Right. So in some sense, it, it works for the world in terms of getting access to physical activity uh, mm -hmm. that involves kicking and punching. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I got into that early. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Professor, for your time and your uh, input today. It's time for us to wrap things up. We appreciate your presence here today. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, that's all we have for you on this edition of Point World Affairs. Do tune in again next week for a brand new episode. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye for now.